Mary, my betrothed. You have the most beautiful eyes I've ever seen, and the sweetest smile. Don't be afraid. I'm the Lord's servant. Help us! Please! Lady, I believe your son is the promised king of his people. What is his name? His name is Jesus. Your baby boy would one day walk on water. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to me? This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to the blind man? Peter, Mary, where's my did son? You know that your baby storm with his hand didn't you know that your baby boy has walked where angels try and when you kiss your little baby you kiss the face of God oh man My son. Mary, did you know? I watched every moment. It is the hardest thing any mother could ever have to do. But if, through his swollen, blackened eyes, he looked down from that cross, darkened by the shadow of awful crucifixion, I wanted to make sure he saw the face of one person who loved him. And he did. I almost broke down. His eyes met mine, the same eyes that looked up at me from that hay-filled manger, the eyes that brimmed with tears as I cleaned his skinned elbow, the eyes that read the scrolls in the synagogue, the eyes that looked over Jerusalem and wept, the eyes that saw every need every wound, every hurt, every sinful soul, and refused to look away. I knew long ago he was meant for a purpose. When you're visited by an angel, you start to understand that this baby you're carrying might be something more. When shepherds come to kneel at his makeshift cradle, a mother suspects that her baby's life will not be an ordinary one. When wise men bring gifts worth more money than the carpenter shop brings in in an entire year, a mother should know that Yahweh has a plan bigger than she can wrap her mind around. When a mother finds her 12-year-old explaining the law of the prophets to the greatest teachers in Jerusalem, she can be fairly certain that there's something different in store for this boy. When your son looks in your face and says he has to be about his father's business and something in your heart tells you that he doesn't mean carpentry, your heart skips with the realization that this road will not be an easy one. When your son transforms plain water into the finest wine, when he restores heals the lame, even raises the dead, you know that this proves the divine invention behind his intention behind his birth. These are the moments I've treasured in my heart. But a mother will worry, won't she? And I have. 
The more attention he drew to himself, the more the authorities threatened and whispered. The more I found myself wishing he would just come back to the carpenter shop and make a simple living. He's quite a good carpenter, you know. From the time Joseph taught him the skills, he worked hard to master them. I love to watch him work, pounding, sawing, sanding, tables, chairs, bowls, ladles, and then when each one matched the plan he'd sketched out on the parchment, he would wipe away the dust, step back, spread his arms, smile, and say three simple words. Three words were a declaration of completion. You know. I heard those words again today. As a mother knows, I knew that they meant much the same thing, though infinitely magnified. No furniture, no housewares this time, but still, there was a plan, sketched out and in place since before my son was formed in my womb, and I suspect for much longer. Today, on that cross, his arms spread wide open. I, I am almost positive that I saw on that bruised, wounded, blood-covered face, beyond belief, a smile. And before he even said them, I knew the words he was going to say. I knew before he said them the words that came next. It is finished. But a mother knows things. Yes, it is finished. Without a doubt it is finished. It is finished. But it isn't over.
It was early on the first day of the week, and while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, and she saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. Why do you look for the living amongst the dead? He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. My friends, we have gone through Palm Sunday, where Jesus came to the, the glorious city, the holy city of God, and made his entrance. We went to the hill on Golgotha, where the body of Christ was crucified and died and was buried. And now at the tomb, we have come only to discover that the tomb was empty. In place, two angels dressed in white who said, he is not here, he is risen just as he said. Throughout the next 40 days, Jesus came and he visited with Mary, with the disciples, and then with hundreds and hundreds more, showing and telling that he has conquered the grave, showing and telling what he said is trustworthy and true, showing what he said that in our end is our beginning. Let us stand and sing as we are able, our opening hymn, The Lord of the Dance.
be seated. Please be seated. After all, David Hayes, I'm sure you need a break. My friends, Jesus Christ once said that I am the life of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but they shall walk in the light of life. Many years ago, 800 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah said, the people in walk in darkness have seen a great light. The people who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has dawned. And on that Easter day, the light of Christ, the love of God, shone brightly. And even on this rather miserable day, it shines here. It shines here in this place that we call the house of God. It shines in the hearts of the people of God. And so, as we have come into this place, as we have gathered as the people, as we have gathered as the people of the light, let us come together with the words of God that have helped to bring us to this place here today as we say together our words from 1 Corinthians on our screen. And let us say it together. Friends, let me go over the message with you one final time. This message that I proclaimed and that you have made your own. This message on which you took your stand and by which your life has been saved. The first thing I did was place before you what was placed so emphatically before me that the Messiah died for our sins, exactly as the scripture tells it, and that he was buried and that he was raised from the dead on the third day. Again, exactly as scripture says, that he presented himself alive to Peter, then to his closest followers, and later to more than 500 of his followers at the same time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the very beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life. And that life was the light to all mankind. And that light shone in the darkness. And the darkness hasn't overcome it. And to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his holy name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And he is our Lord. He's the Lord in the good times, He's the Lord in the bad times. He's the Lord of sorrows. He's the Lord of hope. Indeed, he is the Lord of the dance. When Jesus wanted to be the closest he could to his Father, he prayed. But he rarely prayed alone. He gathered the people that he loved the very best to come with him. Whenever you look at the scriptures, he's praying, usually with his closest fellows, Peter, James, and John. Today we've gathered. Today we've gathered in the house of God. We gather as the people of God. We have come because of what happened many years ago and the love that he still gives to us here today. The light of Christ is here. So let us gather as friends and family, people of church, people of faith, 
as we pray together our Easter prayer. And let's pray together. Loving Father, on this Easter Sunday, we have seen the veil of darkness transformed to the brightest light. On this Easter Sunday, we have seen the most dreadful end become the most beautiful beginning. On this Easter Sunday, we have seen the depths of despair fade to reveal hope everlasting. And on this Easter Sunday, we have seen the curse of death defeated by eternal life. Amen. Now before we go on to our scripture, the story of why we are here, I just want to tell you just a little story. Now when I was just a, a young lad growing up, during the summer, you know, my mother would be working, and she didn't want, I live, uh, we lived in Halifax, my grandmother lived in, in Glace Bay in Cape Breton, about a five hour one way trip between one, the two places. Now my mother, she was working during the summer, and she wanted me to come down and spend my time with my grandmother. Now my grandmother was also working, but if you're going to be staying uh, in a place during the summer, you'd much rather be staying in Cape Breton than in Halifax. Well, I'll tell you, it was sometime in June, and I woke up this morning, and I was positive it was Easter. I don't know why I thought it was Easter. Maybe I just dreamed of chocolate that day, I don't know. But when I woke up, I thought it was Easter. And so I went from my bed and I came downstairs. My grandmother was at work, but you know, there was always breakfast there waiting for me whenever I came down. I came down, breakfast was there, with a note, always a note. Dear JD, love you lots, XO, XO. Well, I ate down my breakfast. And then I went into the living room, because that's where Easter eggs usually appeared. Well, I started looking. I looked in the yellow Lazy Boy chair that was my grandmother's. I looked in the love seat that we had acquired somewhere along the road. I looked behind the sofa. I looked on top of the chandelier. Well, really, it was just an ordinary light fixture, but my grandmother always called it the chandelier. I looked over at the the 24-inch TV, which was considered a big deal back then. It was even in color. I looked everywhere, and yet no Easter eggs could be found. Then I started wondering. I know Santa doesn't come if you're bad. Was I bad? Did my grandmother find all the eggs before she went to work and ate them all? Wouldn't put a pastor. Well, I finally looked around behind a pillow, behind an old accordion, I found one small little Easter egg in tinfoil, pink tinfoil as a matter of fact, and I opened it up and I tasted it and it was the sweetest it ever was. Well, after a little while, my grandmother came back home. She went to work. She had to leave leave at around 4.30, and she came back around 3. Well, around 3, she came back home. And I said, Nan, I looked everywhere for the Easter bunny and the Easter eggs, and I couldn't find anything. She said, J.D., today's not Easter. Today is just June. Well, Nan, I said, I found this little Easter egg. And she looked at the tin foil, and she smelled it and everything like that, and she said, J.D., I guess that was an Easter egg from, from days gone by. I said, it tasted just as good. She said, J.D., the gifts from God, regardless of the day on the calendar, the gifts of God are always there. And when you look for them, you will find them. They're there every day of the week for you. And you know what? I always kept that close to my heart. And later on, when I started going to Sunday school and, and Mrs. Croft would be teaching us Bible lessons, one of, the, first, one of the first Bible lessons I had, not the first, the first was John 3.16, 
But one of the very first was from Jeremiah. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. If you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with all of your heart, and I will be found by you. My friends, regardless of whether it's a sunny day or a day like today, regardless of whether it's Easter on the calendar or just a day in June, know that the love of God, the gifts of God, the promises of God, the truth of God are there for each and every one of us. All we have to do is open our eyes, see, accept, and receive. And that's just a little story I leave with you here today. And my friends, on this day when we celebrate the gift that Jesus gave us of victory over the grave, when we celebrate the gift that God has given us, a love and a life without end, let us come with the gifts that only we can give. Our offering will now be accepted. seek to give back to God a small measure of what we have received. Let us also give back to God the prayer God gave to us to say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the book of John. John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. And it goes like this. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And so she came running to Simon Peter, and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb, both running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. 
He bent over and he looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and he believed. They still did not quite understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. And at this she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't realize that it was Jesus. He asked her again, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking that he was a gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned towards him. She cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And then she told him all the things that he had said. Blink. There came a kind and gentle man from a town called Galilee. Spent his whole life reaching out to folks like you and me. He said his father sent him bearing gifts from up above. To those believing in him, he offered faith, hope, and love with his arms wide open. He walked from town to town with his arms wide open that each lost sheep might be found from the youngest to the old to the weak and wayward souls with his arms wide open he came gathering his fold now when he talked about his kingdom well he threw the king's a curve cause with all his father's power he toyed, he came to serve. The weary and the destitute were the ones that he called friends. No wonder that he had prostitutes and even lepers follow him with his arms wide open. He welcomed one and all with arms wide open. He tore down all those walls from sinners filled with shame to the blind and the lame with his arms wide open. He loved them all the same when his days on earth were through. He'd given all that he could give. So it's no surprise that he died the same way that 
he lived with his arms wide open he hung there from a cross with his arms wide open that no one soul would be lost he turned the other cheek when they nailed him to a tree with his arms wide open he rescued you and me with his arms wide open he set this whole world free with his arms wide open he bought The person of Jesus Christ died a little over 2,000 years ago. But what does that mean for me? What does a man who died on the cross, nailed to that cross, buried in an empty tomb, buried in a tomb, which was discovered to be empty several days later, how does that change my life? Interesting story. But how does that affect me? I want to take a look today at how the resurrection gives us hope. You see, when Jesus Christ was, was crucified 33 AD, he only had about 120 followers. Followers at that time. He had spent the last several years building up his ministry. But at the end, he had maybe 120 followers and really, if you see how they ran away, maybe he had even fewer than that. But today, today, 2,000 years later, two and a half billion people around this world claim to be followers of Christ. Two and a half billion. Now let me put that in perspective. That means one out of every three people in this planet would say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. The Christian church is by far, by far the largest organization on this planet. Nothing else comes close to the size of the Christian church. Nothing else comes close. Two and a half billion followers of Christ. The church is bigger than North America. The church is bigger than North America and Europe put together. The Christian church, the followers of Christ, is bigger than North America, Europe, and China put together. Nothing is bigger on planet Earth than the church of Jesus Christ. How did that happen? How did that happen when Jesus was here for three years? How did that happen? when he was taken and killed in front of everyone. Why did Christianity spread so far and so fast? How did a little band of, of poor, you know, 12 poor fishermen, you know, the kind of people that Jesus chose to be his followers, how did that expand into one out of every three people on planet Earth, on every continent? There are followers of Jesus Christ. How did that happen? One word, the resurrection. It changed everything. When Jesus said that he would suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, but after three days rise again, and then did it, that is the single most significant event in history. Nothing else comes close. It split history into A.D. and B.C., every event in history is dated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, either before or after. Even your birthday. Even your birthday is dated by the day, month, and year of how long it's been since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. J.D. Kennedy was born 1,967 years, 5 months, and 27 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ 
the single most significant event in history. When Jesus Christ was crucified, when he was whipped, when he was beaten to within an inch of his life, when his hands and feet were nailed to a cross much like that, and then his lifeless body deposited in a borrowed tomb, his followers were left disconsolate. They were left depressed, disillusioned, and defeated. They had put their hope and love and trust in that man, and look where it led him. Where was it going to leave them? And yet, on Easter morn, the resurrected and risen Christ met them, and they were transformed into courageous and contagious people. Contagious people, contagious with hope. Why? Because they began to spread that message of hope everywhere. Everywhere because they saw Christ come back to life, and it changed them. It changed them. It changed everything. Everything they thought they knew about life and death and life after death, they changed everything they thought about, about God and God's relationship with us. That is the kind of hope that Jesus gave to the people back then. But you know what? He is still the risen Lord. And Christians, we should be the most hopeful people on this planet. We should have more hope than anyone else because of what Jesus did on Easter, on Easter morning. He rose again. Jesus repeatedly said over and over and over again, I'm going to die on a cross to pay for all your sins. He said it over and over and over. And then he said, but... But then I'm going to come back to life three days later and prove to you that I am who I say I am. And now, if you hadn't done that second part, the resurrection part, well, the first part doesn't really matter. Lots of people die. But he died and came back. And my friends, that changes everything. It gives us hope. A contagious hope, a contagious hope that will infect every aspect of our lives. How does it infect us? How does it change our lives? Well, for the first reason, Jesus' resurrection gives us hope that we're forgiven, completely forgiven. Jesus once said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you, you will find rest for your souls. When you hurt someone, say it's physically, you hit them, perhaps you cause an accident in which they're hurt. When you hurt someone emotionally, maybe you cheated on a spouse. Maybe you bully someone by calling them names. Maybe you, you talk about them behind your back and share some personal information, whether it's to uh, your next-door neighbor or, or perhaps on the Internet. When you hurt someone, whether intentionally or accidentally, you're hurt as well. People act differently towards you. Sure, they might, they might listen to your gossip about the neighbor, but they learn not to trust you with any personal information about themselves. People start looking at you differently. And my friends, when you look in the mirror, you start looking at yourself differently too. When you hurt someone, accidentally or intentionally, it drives a wedge between you and that person. And that relationship will forever be changed. The trust that you had for that person is either bent or broken. And as the person who caused that hurt, you start carrying along regrets. You start carrying around remorse. You start carrying around, around the shame, and you start wishing that you've done things differently. But my friends, you can't relive the past and do it better. You can't take back those words once they've been spoken. The guilt you feel 
And the isolation of these, these actions cause fatigues you. It tires you. It robs you of peace of mind. It takes joy from your life. Not only does it take joy from your life, but it robs you of your self-esteem in the sense that you can no longer look at yourself as a good person. Am I still a good person? Am I still worthy of love? And those actions not only drives a wedge between you and that other person, but it also drives a wedge between you and God. And my friends, as a minister, I can tell you, lots of people have come to me and said, J.D., the reason why I don't go to church is because of the things that I've done. The reason why I don't take communion is because I'm not worthy of God's love. I'm not worthy of, of that love, and I don't deserve it. But what did God say? He said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. He didn't say, come to you who are spotless and white as snow. He said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. What does the Bible tell us? It says, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Jesus Christ came to this world to pay for your sins, to take them away. Your actions, your words, they may have driven a wedge between you and, and some other relationship, but Jesus Christ came to say, I have removed the wedge between you and God. They might be saying, well, geez, J.D., that's great. Those are great words, but, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know who I am. You don't know what I've done. And that's true. I don't. I don't. But God does. God sees you. He has heard you. He has heard your silent tears that you share with no one else. And listen to what he has to say. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers or nor, nor heights nor depths, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God sees you. God knows you. And God loves you. Nothing can change that. You are his child. You are his wonderful creation. And he will not turn you away. He might turn you to a better path. But he'll never turn you away. And that pathway always leads to home. No matter what you have done, there is a place for you. In his family, in his house, at his table, in the city of God. The second reason we can have hope is that we can now have God's Spirit within us. His Spirit is the Spirit of power. The night before Jesus went to the cross, before he died, he said, Guys, I'm going to be leaving you. I'm going back to heaven. But I'm going to send my spirit to be inside of you. And on Easter, Jesus began appearing to people. He appeared and he spoke with Mary. He appeared and spoke with his disciples. He appears and speaks to hundreds of other people, hundreds. And now at the end of 40 days, Jesus ascends back up to heaven. But before he does, in Acts 1.80, Jesus says this. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power. And you will tell people everywhere about me in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, to the very ends of the earth. And so ten days later, we have the 40 days after the resurrection, then another ten days, God's Holy Spirit 
came and blew amongst them. In church land, we call that Pentecost. And this is why Christianity spread so fast after the resurrection. They had seen Jesus face to face, and then he says, listen, I'm going to send my spirit to be in you, and you'll be able to do things that you never, ever thought you could ever do on your own. I'll be with you. And what happened? They went from fearful to fearless. They've gone from hopeless to hopeful. They have gone from being cowards to being courageous. Let's take on the Roman Empire. Nothing is going to stop us now. Why? Because they had seen Jesus Christ alive. Why? Because now they have the power of the Holy Spirit active and working in their lives. And despite crucifying Jesus, despite trying to hunt down his followers, despite making Christianity illegal, despite throwing people to the lions for sport, within 300 years, Christianity was made the official religion of the Roman Empire. And the empire that fought to kill Jesus now bends a knee and begins to worship him. If you think that's amazing, just wait. There's something even more amazing to come. The power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that split history into A.D. and B.C., that very same power is available to you on a daily basis. You may be saying, well, come on, J.D., really? Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 says, I pray that you'll begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe him. It's the same mighty power that raised Jesus, raised Christ from the dead. What's that power? It's the power of God's Spirit in your life. What does that mean to you? Well, let me put it to you this way. If God's Spirit can raise a dead Jesus, it can raise a dead marriage. If God's Spirit can raise a dead person, it can raise a dead career. If God can raise a dead man, he can raise a dead dream, a dream that you thought was dead and buried. He can lift it up. He can do that in your life. What is that power? It's the power to be free from your past. It's the power to break the, the memories that have been holding you back. It's the power to start over when you feel like giving up. It's the power to change what you think could never, ever be changed on your own. It's the power to, to overcome habits and hurts and hang-ups, those things that hold you back. It's the power to keep you going when you feel like giving up. And my friends, that power is available to you. That's resurrection power. And that gave them hope. And that's why we can have hope today. And finally, the reason we can have hope is that we no longer have to fear the grave. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send a Son into this world to condemn this world, but to save the world through him. God said, I love you so much that I never want to let you go. Jesus Christ said, I'd rather go to the cross for you than go back to heaven without you. God loves you so much that he'll do anything to bring you back home. Now, folks, I can't speak for yourselves. I can only speak for myself. But in my life, my mother has died, my father has died, my brother has died, my grandmother has died. Death has taken away people who love me. Death has taken away joy from my life. Death has been able to take away 
some love for my life, some joy for my life. But death has not been able to take away hope for my life. And the reason why I have that hope is because of the night before he died, Jesus gathered the people that he loved the very best, and he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me that in my Father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and welcome you into my presence. How do I know that is true? The resurrection. Easter Sunday. Jesus went. He prepared a place. And then he came back and he said, when this is your time, you are welcome here. He is not a teacher that points to a God who saves. No, he is the God who saves to whom other teachers point. And he has prepared a place for me. And my friends, he's prepared a place for you. In our Father's house are many rooms. And one day, one day, when I go, my mother will be there. My father will be there. My brother will be there. My grandmother will be there. Restored. No longer ravaged by cancer. No longer with a wonky heart. But restored to the people that God intended them to be. And we'll be together again. Because of the resurrection, we have a life, and more importantly, we have a love that has no end. To which I can only say, thanks be to God, and amen. Let us stand and sing. Let us stand and sing. And I'll talk a little bit longer so Stephanie can get up to the piano. <laughs> Let us stand and sing. Our hymn when the roll is called young.
And now, my friends, we have come to a time and a place of significance and sacrifice. Jesus Christ said, I stand at your door and knock. And if you invite me in, I will come in and eat with you. But my friends, this is the house of the Lord. We have come to his house, and a table has been prepared. And please note that this table has been prepared not by J.D. Kennedy or Pat Kosh or, or the session of, of Winslow United Church. It has been prepared by the United Church of Canada, no. This has been prepared by Jesus Christ. And there has always been a place for you at this table. And if you've never ever come before, or you haven't come for a long time, please know that that place has always been there. And even if you feel that you're coming as a friend, remember what he said. Come to me, all who are weary and heavenly hidden. You are welcome at this table. And even if, even if you feel that you come as a stranger, when you spend some time with the Lord, when you eat at this table, you may come as a stranger, but you will leave as a friend because you are now part of the family. Because of COVID times, things are going to be operating a little bit differently. And even though this might not be, you know, your minister's uh, desired way of having communion, the important thing is, is to gather as friends and family at a table in the presence of God and share those things that give life to us, that sustain not just our body, but our souls on this day where we recognize and we thank God for the gift of life and love without end. When you came in, you were giving two little bits. I asked that you take the tops off because I found at Christmas time when we had communion that those little plastic tops, they're a bit of a bugger to get off in a hurry. And so if you can keep them, take them off and keep them open for now for a little bit, it might save us all a little bit of struggle in, 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 in later on. Now, folks, also, I can't speak for any other household, but at the Kennedy household, we always say a prayer. Before we meet, before we, we always have a prayer, we always have a call, it's called a grace. And sometimes it's, it's very important sounding, and sometimes it sounds kind of silly. Rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. Very quick. But we're not going to be doing that one today. But we are going to be saying a grace. In church land, we call it a communion liturgy. But what it is, it's a grace. Where we thank God for the gifts that we've received. And then seal that with our presence and the taking of nourishment into our bodies and into our souls. I'm going to be showing this on the screen. The folks over there have had a, a pamphlets that we put out a few days before just to make sure that everything is as good as we can make it. And when you see black words, I'm going to be saying those. If you see red words, you guys are going to be saying those. And if you make a mistake, just remember that sermon when I talked about sins being forgiven. It's all good here. But the whole idea is, is come together with reverence, thanks, and praise. And hopefully, we can begin. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to all. Lift up your hearts. 
We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is good to give thanks and praise. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of light, giver of all life, source of love. At your word, creation dawns, and under your rainbow, the floods recede. With the burning of the bush, you hallow this earth, and by pillar of fire, you guide your people. And we praise you. We praise you that you do not abandon us. You place a child in Mary's womb, and you place a star in the eastern sky. And you send Jesus to be the light to all the nations. And you bring sight to the blind, healing to the sick, hope to the despairing, and justice to the oppressed. And yet, and yet we reject him. We reject him. We betray him. We crucify him. But you, O oh God, bring forth the light, raising him from the grave, the firstborn of your new creation. And therefore we join with all of creation, with all the heavenly hosts who dwell in light inaccessible to say together, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Mary was standing outside the tomb, crying as she wept. She stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head, the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she said. And I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus. Mary, Jesus said, don't cling for me. I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God, to your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. She gave them this message. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. We do what Jesus did on the night before he died. He took bread. He gave thanks. He broke the bread. And he gave it to his friends. And he said, Take, eat, remember me. And then he took the cup and he said, Take, drink, and remember. My friends, the body of Christ broken for us, eat this in remembrance of him. And my friends, this is the blood of Christ, spilled for us. Drink this and receive eternal life. My friends, let's bow our minds and hearts just for a quick moment in prayer. Loving God, as we gather in your midst here today, we want to thank you. We want to thank you that you sent your Son to us. We want to thank you for his message, his message of love and peace. We want to thank you that he didn't just come to teach, that he came to save. And because of his victory over the grave, our sins have been wiped away. On your record books, there is nothing under our names. Whatever blot on our souls were there are erased and gone now. That there is no longer a barrier between you and us. And we want to thank you. We want to thank you for the resurrection power that you have placed in our lives that power that, that we can use to overcome those things that have always stayed in our way. That you didn't come to give us, give us escape. That you came to give us victory. And just as, as you 
made Moses go back into the land that he ran away from. But different. Because of the power that you placed in his life. Just as you gave Peter and James and John and all the other disciples the power to, to overcome their fear. To go out in this world that they had, had run away from. To spread your message. You give that to us. And so is anything impossible when we have you at our side? And the answer is no. If you can raise a dead body, you can raise a dead dream. Or even better, give us new dreams that we never had the courage to dream before. And finally, O oh Lord, we want to thank you that you have given us victory over the grave. Lord, life can be hard. This life right here in this broken world is hard. That is why you came. That is why you forgave those sins. That is why you have given us that power to, to help us live in this world. But you also gave us the knowledge and the faith that this world is not our home that there is light and high beauty forever beyond the reach of this world. But that is not out of reach for you. And that is the place where you're drawing us to. Lord, there's lots of people that we've loved who now dwell with you. And even though it may be painful living here without them, we are thankful that they live with you. We are thankful that, that their tears have been wiped away. That their bodies broken by age or illness or disease or defect or substance has now been removed. Lord, We want to thank you that they are with them. And that one day, we will take our turn. That you offer us not just a life without end, because life in this world can be hard, but that you offer us a love without end. That in our Father's house are many rooms, and there is one there for us. Lord, on this Easter, we thank you. May you bless us and keep us. And it's in your name we pray, O oh Lord. Amen. Well, my friends, we've pretty much come to the end of our time here together, and I want to thank you. I want to thank you for tuning in and making us part of your worship experience for this week. Now, folks, my friends, that's amazing. That is amazing, and that is faith. And you know what? The powerful lesson that this year has taught me that the people of God will find a way to be together. After all, we're called to be the church. And we're called to celebrate God's presence. And over this past year, we have. Be it during a lockdown in a pandemic, during an ice storm, whether it's on the internet or right here in person at Winslow United Church, God will find a way of being with his people and his people will find a way of being with their God. My friends, that is a miracle. That is the hope that has infected us all. And so, my friends, until we meet again, and we shall meet again, stay safe, and may God bless you richly. Amen.